Thank you, Detlef. Let me start by taking you back to 1950. In 1950, outside of the United States, we barely used natural gas anywhere. But in the decades that followed, year on year, the use of natural gas grew. And natural gas surpassed 75 trillion cubic feet of demand in 1990. So what had changed? What had made this difference? The answer, of course, is infrastructure. We built thousands of kilometers of pipelines, LNG terminals, and hundreds of LNG carrier ships to connect the sources of supply with the centers of demand, with industry and with households. And gas became a major fuel for our economy. But you may be wondering, why is he talking about gas? I thought this is the hydrogen session. Well, the point is, um, we are with hydrogen today where we were with gas in 1950s. We are at the beginning of a fundamental shift in the energy system, and there are many parallels. Like gas, hydrogen will be available and abundant in some places, but we will need it in others. Like gas, hydrogen will be expensive at first, but reduce in cost over time and then replace oil, coal, and ultimately gas. And as with gas, infrastructure, transport infrastructure, midstream, will be absolutely decisive for the success of, of the hydrogen economy. My name is Marcus Wiltoner. I'm a partner with McKinsey in the Brussels office, and I co-lead our work on hydrogen technology. Let's take a look at hydrogen demand. Depending on the scenario that you look at, uh, we will need somewhere between 400 and 600 million tons of hydrogen in the long run. That's about 10 to 20 percent of final energy demand. So that means in an optimistic scenario, hydrogen will be as important as gas is for our energy system today. The important thing to remember here is there is not a single credible net zero scenario out there that doesn't need hydrogen. So if we don't have hydrogen, we're not going to get to net zero. Now, how quickly will we have it? The key here, in our opinion, is the cost of supply. Because we all want to decarbonize, but we don't want to pay double or triple or even more for our energy. So how do we get uh, the cost of supply down? Well, first of all, we need to make hydrogen where it is cheap to make. And that for green hydrogen, which we make out of electricity, is where we have lots of sun and wind. For blue hydrogen, where, it is, where we have gas and where we have places to store the carbon. Look at this chart, which is a cost curve of demand, uh, the cost curve of supply uh, in 2030 for clean hydrogen. What you can see here is all the way on the left, there are places like the Middle East, North Africa, Latin America, Australia, where we can produce hydrogen as cheap as one or one and a half dollars per kilogram. But if you look on the right, you see some of the places where we will need a lot of hydrogen, Central Europe, Japan. And there it will be up to five times more expensive to make the hydrogen. So there's an obvious case here to start transporting hydrogen from one place to the other to use, make arbitrage of that uh, opportunity. In the last nine months, together with uh, the Hydrogen Council and 140 companies that are part of the council, we built a simulation model to look at where will hydrogen be produced and where will it be used and how will we transport it between those two. And what we found is that in a cost-efficient world, we would actually transport two-thirds of the hydrogen long distance. We um, gonna not, not, I'm not going to bore you with tons of details from the study, but I'm going to show you one chart. But it will be a complex chart. At least we try to use some colors, so that's really innovative here, right? <laughs> On the left-hand side of the chart, you see the key producers. And I want to direct your attention to North America, China, and Middle East as the largest producers. The first two, North America and China, produce a lot for their own energy demand, and they transport that hydrogen mostly through pipelines to connect regions with ample green renewable capacity to those regions where we need a lot of energy. If you look on the right-hand side, you see the big consumers, and you see that places like Europe, but also Japan, Korea, will heavily rely on imports, as they do today. These imports come from places like North Africa, Middle East, Latin America, and Australia. Now let's look at the middle of the chart, because I think that's actually the most interesting part of it. This is how will we transport this hydrogen. And you see in the upper part that about half of it goes through pipelines. Some of those are new pipelines that we don't yet have. Some of those are pipelines that used to be gas pipelines that are refurbished. 
The other half goes by ship. And here notice that derivatives, so products, intermediate products that we make out of hydrogen, account for the lion's share. So what we ship around is not hydrogen, but it is ammonia, it is synthetic fuels, it is hot briquetted iron, which is the, what we use to make green steel in the end. Now, if you look at this chart as an infrastructure investor, as a developer, or as an EPC company, you can either see a huge challenge or a huge opportunity, depending on whether you're an optimist or not. But how big of an opportunity is this? Looking at the more aggressive scenarios up to 2030, we'll need something like 950 billion investment into these value chains. That includes the upstream part, renewables, electrolyzers, reformers, and that actually accounts for the lion's share, about 60% of those 950 billion. About 15% of the investments go into the midstream, so the things we use to transport that hydrogen. But these 15% are really, really decisive because if we run the simulation once without trade, where we produce all the hydrogen in the same place where we need it, and once with trade, where we produce the hydrogen where it's most cost efficient and we transport it, we find a cost difference of 40% in 2030. 40%. Imagine what difference that makes to industry, to the users, and what difference that makes to the uptake of hydrogen, how much that will accelerate the transition. So to simplify again, no net zero without hydrogen, but no hydrogen without the right transport infrastructure. But let's not be super naive. It's gonna be a huge challenge to build all this stuff. And I wanna highlight three challenges and opportunities uh, in particular. The first one, equipment scale up. What you see uh, on the screen right now is an electrolyzer, the device that uses electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's really the heart of the green hydrogen economy. These have been around for a while, but at small scale, and now we need to massively scale up the industry. We need to scale up this industry actually four times as fast as we scaled up solar PV manufacturing. That scale up is also a big opportunity because it means that we can start optimizing product designs for mass manufacturing. We can industrialize and automate assembly. We can improve the supply chain and components. And when we do this with clients, with actual products, we find we can reduce costs by as much as 60% in the next five years. So there's a big opportunity here to take costs out and make the deliver, uh, delivered costs of hydrogen cheaper. The next big opportunity challenge is the delivery of these mega projects. Imagine for a moment a project in Australia where we have a big solar array, a wind array, uh, an electrolyzer, and a plant to make ammonia. That plant is very capex intense. About 90% of the delivered cost is capex, 90%. So that means the plants that are gonna be cost competitive, the plants that are gonna earn a lot of money, are not only those that we build where there's lots of sun and wind, but it is those plants that are well designed and that are well delivered. That will make a huge difference to reduce the costs and to make profits. And here we can, as an EPC, construct, com, com, uh, EPC company or as a uh, consultant on the, on the project design, you can make a big difference. We can use all the classical project value improvement levers and we can do something that we talked about yesterday, building this industry digital first. With advanced models, we can now simulate and build these things completely on a computer and optimize everything down to tailoring it to sun and wind profiles uh, finding the actually exact point of perfect efficiency, etc. So we can really change the way we design these plants and deliver them. And if you combine these levers, we think in the design stage, you can reduce the cost of delivered goods of this thing of up to 25%. That's about three to 4% of IRR on top of your normal IRR. And if you imagine that many of these are levered, that's a big difference to you as equity investors. Let's talk about the last challenge, often called the chicken and egg problem. And it's really about making these projects bankable because to reduce costs, we need to reduce cost of capital. For that, we need lending from banks. But banks are not comfortable with taking the risk. Nobody knows what's the price of green ammonia in 10 years from now, right? So how do we, how do we solve this problem? How do we build factories when we don't yet have fixed order books to back those factories up? And here, there's really two actors that can play a role. One is cooperation along the value chain. And we see some very innovative 
solutions where developers, equipment producers, and off-takers of the hydrogen work together in framework contracts, in joint ventures, in alliances to stop the stalemate, to overcome it, and to move forward. The other big role is regulators, and here, um, with the IRA in the US, we have a very ambitious and generous benefit of $3 per kilogram of hydrogen. That enables the business case today that provides this certainty that we need in order to raise finance and deliver this project successfully. So let me leave you with uh, three messages. One is there's no net zero without hydrogen, and we won't have hydrogen without the right infrastructure, and in fact, lots of infrastructure and fast. The second one is, if you are interested to learn more about this, please join us tomorrow. We have a roundtable with industry leaders and experts to talk about all of these challenges and opportunities in lots more detail. And third, if all of this seems very futuristic, well, in a way it is, but imagine you were in the 1950s and somebody would have told you that gas will be the fuel of the future. Well, you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't have believed it. So what we need to do now is get to work. Thank you.